Great, thanks everybody. Um, we're now getting started on our, uh, our next panel. So climate financial decision making in the context of data and analytics. And hopefully as we do this, you'll begin to see how various parts of the day are beginning to, to join up. Um, so delighted that the panel will be chaired by Joe, Joe Paisley. We've got a fantastic group of people representing broad range of different financial institutions. Uh, and then uh, Chris will be starting with uh, an opening presentation. But Joe, over to you to take you forward from here. Oh, great. Okay. Right. Well, we heard about the um, kind of policy frameworks. Um, sounded a bit like a nightmare to me, actually. Um, but anyway, and now we're going to be talking about data and analytics. And some of that data you'll be getting from reporting and others will be just available from other sources. I should probably just say a little bit about GARP, actually, thinking about it. GARP is a global association of risk professionals, and we're a US-based not-for-profit that focuses on uh, risk education. So our mission in life is to raise the standards of risk management globally. And I've been at GARP now, um, this is probably my sixth year, and focused practically all the time on climate risk, increasingly nature risk and sustainability. So. That's my interest in all of this. And because we're risk people, we're obsessed with data and analytics, which is probably why I got invited to chair this panel. So to set the scene, we're actually going to start with a presentation from Chris, um, who's going to be talking about data and analytics, I hope. And, and then we'll come back, and I'll introduce the rest of the panel, and we'll get a conversation going. Over to you, Chris. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, so Matt's asked me to um, come and say a word or two about um, kind of the evolution of, uh, of where we've got to on data and metrics. And um, in particular, what I'm going to be doing is just briefly flipping the lid on a couple of those evolutionary stages, phases that he had in his, his opening um, session. But, but before I, I do that, I just want to set a scene a little bit about my background. So um, I spent 20 years working on climate policy, and I've been working in finance just for the last five. I'm, I can't really get away with saying that I don't know anything about finance now. Um, so I work at Impacts Asset Management, um, specialist investor in the transition, and I, I head our policy and advocacy work there. But the thing that I guess I, I, I brought from my policy work um, was a kind of relentless and rather kind of personally... Um, frustrating but driving um, focus on ambition. You know, if you worked in climate change policy for 20 years and you start to see what's happening now, you kind of are realizing that what we're seeing is what we all thought we were going to avoid and mitigate. Um, but also um, a focus, I think, on recognizing scarcity and urgency. So, you know, there's scarcity, in not just in terms of, you know, the science and the, and, and the urgency that comes out of that, but also the time and human capital that's kind of involved in solving this issue. Um, we've got to avoid, there's no time for us to kind of make missteps, and therefore the sort of pursuit of um, what might look like useful activities but are actually just well-intentioned displacement activities is not a luxury we have. So we have to be very disciplined about our use of data and metrics, uh, and we have to focus both those finite resources and finite political capital on, on things that are really important and avoid unintended consequences. So that's kind of what drives some of this thinking. And a, a real area that we ended up focusing on through the Climate Financial uh, Risk Forum was, was around data and metrics. So um, back in 2021, um, um, Matt and I worked together on the data and metrics work stream of the Climate, Fa Climate Financial Risk Forum. And uh, one of the things we were doing was we surveyed all of the metrics that were out there around climate-related issues, and the list was kind of bordering 100. So, you know, you quickly sort of realized that that might have been a helpful blooming of many flowers, but actually what we really needed to do was to kind of cut those back to a, a usable set. So we came up with the idea of five use cases, uh, and the five different use cases that we identified were uh, listed down the bottom. Um, this is kind of the output at the end of it, which was, sorry, they're listed at the top as well, which was um, a disclosure dashboard. But basically, if you're starting to think about the impact of climate change on a firm, um, you've got to be focusing on the transition risks, the physical risks, but you have to equally recognize the impact of the firm on the climate. 
Um, there'd been a huge focus just ahead of this work around net zero and the reporting of carbon emissions. But as Matt was saying earlier on, if you just pr protect yourself in terms of your financed emissions, you end up with paper decarbonisation, not much happening in the rest of the economy. So equally, you have to be thinking about what you're doing to finance the transition. And then we recognise that actually engagement is a really important metric, encouraging advocacy uh, and discussion with policymakers. We want to be tracking that, being very conscious of that. And that will affect your own risk management, but also it will be part of a contribution to the wider, uh, wider activities. So we put all this together uh, and came up with this idea of a dashboard um, where we had foundation stretch and advanced metrics. And on the advanced side, it's where we really wanted to get to. How do we have forward-looking metrics? How do we calculate real financial impacts? How do we price risk? Uh, on the left-hand side was meant to be the foundational metrics that anyone could get on with today. And in between, we identified some stretch ones that kind of, you know, the, the more advanced kind of students might be, able to, uh, might be able to focus on. So all of this was adopted by the CFRF. This is actually um, version two of the dashboard that was produced two years later. Because things have moved on that quickly, we refined some of the metrics. We had a load more case studies. So all of that material is out there. And I guess what I wanted to just draw... The parallels with is the work on the TPT. So um, the Transition Plan Task Force, um, which everyone will have read the, the fantastic set of guidance that has come out, the disclosure framework that only came out in October last year, and then I was um, fortunate enough to be asked to co-chair the Asset Managers Working Group. So we produced the Asset Manager Sector Guidance. But you can see that this idea of the strategic and rounded approach is kind of rooted in the same concept. Decarbonizing an entity or even decarbonizing, especially if you're a financial institution, looking at how you decarbonize financed emissions is only really going to happen if you have change in the real economy. Um, what's the correct response to your understanding of climate-related risks and opportunities? Well, it's an understanding of systemic risk and capturing the opportunity that the transition to uh, a low-carbon, climate-resilient economy does. And therefore, this idea of what, can, what you can you do to kind of speed up the flywheel, how can you contribute to that economy-wide transition is, is key. And what the TPT uh, proposed was that you could set out the actions that you can take under these um, five headers of um, foundations, which basically includes your strategic ambition, an implementation strategy that shows how you're going to be delivering those pillars, separate focus on engagement, really important that actually you recognize that you've got a role as a wider kind of citizen, and then metrics and targets to track that, and governance as per TCFD, but kind of accountability sort of at the end of the story rather than at the beginning of the story. So. I think just um, to close, um, what I'd just say is um, two things. Firstly, um, I think this, there are a lot of parallels with what's been discussed earlier on around adopting this disciplined approach to, to metrics. So something like avoided emissions which is um, one of the metrics that we highlighted in the disclosure dashboard, we're only going to get a level of acceptability about that if actually those that are using it um, come together and kind of form a standard. Um, the other way that we can move forward if we get discipline about the number of metrics is that you'll then sort of legitimize those methodologies and we won't, as we do at the moment, have to explain every time we use them. So under the FCA requirements, if you basically report anything other than carbon, you have to set out the details of your methodology. I know this because we're literally in the process of finalizing our TCFD report at the moment and it would be really helpful if there were more accepted ways of doing this. I think the other thing is that we have to use that scarcity uh, of time to focus on what really matters. So as James questioned us earlier on, we've got to put our collective brains together on how we deal with adaptation. The answer is it's a policy problem and a, a kind of private sector problem, but we haven't really established what the respective roles of those different groups are. So there's a massive issue there. And if we are spending all our time counting carbon and reporting that and not looking at, at adaptation, then we're missing a trick. Um, and the last thing I would just say is that um, I guess I'm living with the consequences of all of this now. So um, at IMPACT, we, we've reported against the dashboard metrics because we thought that was a good way to describe uh, what we were doing. TPT came along and internally I got quite a lot of pushback around regulatory burden. Is this something new? Why have we invented something new? God, we're dying death by reporting. Carlotta, 
is in the room. So trademark Carlotta. Um, so we, we can't have death by reporting. So how can we bring these things together? So what we're trying to do in our TCFD report is we're basically using these headers and these activities to try to describe it in the context of what a transition plan would look like. It's, it's not necessarily straightforward, but I think it's helpful. And I think if we can think about those kinds of aspects of how we minimize a, a regulatory burden, how we focus on what's important in terms of use cases, um, I'd love to hear what the panel got to say about how they've tackled those issues in their practical application of this work. Great. Thanks very much. There is a microphone if you want to come and be part of the party. No. Okay. You're not sending me home yet. No, you? no, no. I thought he wasn't going to be part of it. I thought it would be a bit odd me being apart from the rest of the panel. But anyway. So... Um, I think, I think the best thing to do, I'm going to introduce the panel. And just uh, We've got actually a rather nice kind of uh, broad sweep of the finance uh, system here. So we've got our asset manager that you just heard from. Um, and then we've got Deandra Subia, who's uh, Director of Responsible Investment at Ness. That's an asset owner. Uh, then we've got Tony Rook, who's Executive Director, Head of Transition Advisory at Howden, which is... Not really an insurance company, is it? But it's a broker, so you, you can talk about insurance. I thought you were going to call us a kitchen company <laughs> for a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, then we've got Billy Seward from uh, Barclays, head of climate risk there, so we've got a bank. Uh, and then we've got, now am I going to manage to say this? I did say it earlier, didn't you did. I? Arga. No, I've got... What, what's, Siemikinowska. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> Head of Sustainability at Oakley Capital, which is private equity. I, I chickened out there. So we've got many different types of financial institution here. So hopefully we get a really good sense of how data is, is used and, and the, kind of the gaps in the data across these different institutions. So my first question is I'd love you to give some examples of what climate decisions you make um, and where data plays a critical role, and I'm not going to ask you. Okay. Let's start with you. Okay, thanks, Joe. and uh, great to be here. I do feel like Chris stole a lot of my lines, but I'll try and differentiate a little bit. So maybe I'll just say a few words about NEST, um, in case people here haven't heard of us. We're um, the National Employment Savings Trust. We're a UK defined contribution pension scheme that was set up in around 2010 to help facilitate auto-enrolment that came into effect in 2012. Um, auto enrolment has been a fantastic success for pension savings in the UK. We've now got just over 13 million members saving with us, and that comprises nearly one in two of the working population. Um, so what's happened from auto enrolment and the responsibility that Nest has had is that we've now brought on millions of people into our uh, savings fund who now we have the responsibility to save for their retirement. And many of those people have never had exposure to long-term savings before, um, we've had to work hard to really build trust and confidence in saving their money. Um, the vast majority of our members are young, which means that we're going to be investing on their behalf for up to 50, 60 years potentially. Our youngest member who enrolled into the scheme is 16. So we really have to take a long-term perspective to, to the way that we think about managing a member's money and, and be forward-looking. We are a globally diversified investor, so we, are, we see ourselves as a universal owner, which means we own a slice of the, of the global economy which means that we are susceptible to systemic risks. And systemic risks can't be diversified away. So we do have a net, um, a net zero ambition to reach um, sort of net zero by 2050 at the latest, but it's really about the real world change that we're pushing across the economy to mitigate risk for members, because there's no point in them saving hard over 20, 30, 40 years and having to pay for climate change when they retire. Um, so the way that we think about data is that because we are a universal owner and we're, we sit at the top of the asset owner chain or the, or the investment chain, we have to think about the data that we need at the top level. So we participate in a number of industry frameworks. Um, we, we engage a lot with policy um, makers to try and bring about the best possible regulatory frameworks for the whole industry. We need data that's consistent, that's standardised, that's forward-looking, and we really need this data to be embedded across the system. What really hasn't been helpful today is we've seen a range of investment players working on their own frameworks. We've got we work with a number of fund managers who developing who, who are developing their own proprietary frameworks, which is great. But ultimately, we need a, mo a lot more data sharing across the industry, a lot more integration. 
and unified framework. So that's one thing NEST spends a lot of time doing. We have been part of the transition um, plan task force, working on the asset owner group. We fed into the ISSB um, standards. We've been working on the taxonomy for the UK and Europe. So we're really invested at the top to try and help raise standards for data disclosure at the top. So that's one of the responsibilities we have. Um, I mentioned that we have a diversified portfolio. The majority of our assets are in global equities, and that's a global equity mandate invested in companies around the world. We are exposed to um, climate sensitive companies. We do invest in oil and gas, materials, cement, all of these companies that need to think about transitioning and demonstrate that they can thrive in a low carbon economy. So um, we've evolved our global equity mandate to become a climate aware strategy, and we use a range of data to help us do that. As I've said, we are forward-looking, so we're not just interested in carbon intensity or fossil fuel reserves, even though that is one of the metrics that we use. We are overlaying that with a glide path methodology, looking at how companies need to transition within a certain sector. So we use the IEA um, sector targets that have been set for different sectors, and we are monitoring how companies are progressing on that glide path um, in line with the 1.5 degree um, scenario. So we're looking at the emission reduction trend that companies are having. We're also looking at the renewables <coughs> element. We've got a renewables factor that's built in, looking at the extent to which oil and gas companies and utility companies are now evolving their energy mix to generate energy from renewable sources. And we've just in embedded a green revenue scre screen, looking at how much revenues companies are generating from green technologies. So we're thinking much more about that forward-looking aspect as well. And whilst the quantitative elements play a really big role, we think qualitative judgments really um, have a role to play here. Looking just at a set of data isn't helpful. So we look at the extent to which um, companies have set out targets and metrics, the extent that they've uh, committed to public policy positions on climate. And we're also doing a lot of engagement with companies as well to assess the data that they're putting out, challenge them to kind of put more meaningful data out that's going to be more in the interests of investors. So the signaling effect of climate change is hugely important. Um, so we engage with companies and we're more and more vocal about the discussions that we're having with companies and the direction that, that, we need to, uh, that they need to move in. And we are thinking about how we can now feed back some of those engagement judgments into the systematic nature of the fund. Um, so those are the few things that, that Nest is doing at the minute um, around climate data. Yeah, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Oh, great. Tony, how about you? Right. So um, I'd just like to sort of give you a, a little bit of impression. Uh, if you don't know how, then we are primarily an insurance broker, but we do actually work uh, as an underwriter as well um, and in the reinsurance market as well. Uh, we're on a mission to take over the insurance market. We're growing at 25% uh, CAGA every year, and that's been for the last 20 years. So that'll give you an idea of where we're going. Um, data in the insurance market is very much primarily uh, a, a, a focus on how do you price risk? That's what we're in the business of. How do you price the risk of a natural catastrophe event? Like, for example, flood, fire, wildfire, um, inundation from sea, storm damage. Those are the things that most people think of insurance uh, providing as well. But we also price in things like, what is the uh, chance of default on a loan? So providing credit risk. Um, we need data for that. We need to understand where is the company going? Where have they been? What size company are they? Are they a, a good source there? Can we take that risk off a bank, for example? Uh, we also provide technology performance uh, risk. Uh, information. And the reason it's, this is important, understanding what the insurance products are that actually take risk off another party tells you where the data needs to come from. Now increasingly, what we've been uh, doing is looking at, actually, the world is changing and changing rapidly. So if we look at, you know, all of you that um, have a home or have to insure a home or something like that, you'll be looking at, well, what do I have to get in terms of flood risk? Um, and I'm speaking from experience here, having just moved yesterday and having <laughs> gone through this painful process. 
Uh, I wish I could have found an insurance uh, risk product that would um, say whether my, my buyer actually fulfilled or got all of its money to its solicitor, because that would have saved us a few uh, quid yesterday. Um, but you, you need the information uh, about what that company is, where their assets are, you need to understand what type of technologies they're deploying, what is the history of that technology. Um, is that going to be something, for example, installing solar panels? Are they in an area where we're seeing increased incident of hail? Because hail can damage solar panels really, really uh, badly, or really, really well, depending on how you look at it. Um, <laughs> And that increasingly um, is something that we're having in the market. Um, you may have seen the headlines about insurance withdrawing uh, from flood risk in uh, Florida or from wildfire risk in California. These are just some of the examples, and we're starting to have banks come to us and say, what is it that you know that we don't? Um, and the answer is, no, we've got the same models as you. We just use that and... Uh, in some ways, insurance is in the fortunate position that it can say, actually, because we renew every year, we can take a view every year, whereas some other financial institutions take loans on for longer periods. The problem with that is it's like divesting from high carbon to low carbon. There's only so much divestment you can do before you realize you've run out of actually a business. And insurance is in that same position. So we're at a, a tipping point, or a, certainly a turning point, where we need to actually understand and get data on forward-looking view of what the insurability of technologies of companies will be in future, so that we can price that into the market, give longer-term insurance guarantees to help the transition uh, metamorphosis, but also um, so that we can actually tell companies, well, actually, you're investing in this thing, but we don't think that's going to be viable in five, ten years' time because we won't be able to insure it. So you've either got to price into your financial model the fact you're going to have to keep more capital back on the risk uh, front because we won't insure it, or you're going to actually be able to say that business case does not stack up anymore. I think I'll stop there, but data is at the heart of everything, and really the point is, going forward, we need much more forward-looking data, which I'm glad to see the TPT and being a part of that uh, is helping to sort of materialize into the market, as well as the ISSB and others as well. Great. Thank you. Billy, how about your perspective from Barclays? Thanks, Joe. So... Uh, obviously, Barclays, we are a universal bank from retail to wholesale, um, mostly in the UK, Europe, um, and, and in the US, but, but a global footprint. So interestingly, when, when you look at uh, kind of what that means for us, mostly the, the, main, um, the main product we have on the balance sheet effectively is lending in, in its various forms. Uh, but we also uh, have a very large uh, investment bank, and hence we, we have a big role in uh, the allocation of capital um, and fundraising, the raising of financing, generally speaking, by, uh, by companies uh, globally tilted towards the large, the large end of the companies. So um, maybe I'll start with the kind of decisions we've made and the kind of decision we make, uh, and then uh, we, we can think about what the kind of the data or analytics issue kind of that, that support that. Um, fundamentally, this is uh, this is a case um, of uh, making decisions in the face of uncertainty. Uh, for, for for all of us, uncertainty is the case um, for us. So we have an ambition uh, to be a net zero bank uh, and to support uh, the the transition to a low carbon economy of our clients. Um, and concretely, we express that uh, through a series of what I call portfolio level objectives or, or constraints. We adopted the strategy uh, in 2020. So we start with um, a historical uh, business model. Um, and uh, since we've made that, that, uh, that, uh, that commitment, uh, since we've declared that ambition, it's about how we then implement that and, and shift it. So in terms of the big pillars, uh, first of all, we have a um, um, commitment to align the uh, greenhouse gas um, uh, emission of the portfolio uh, to um, 
the objective of the Paris Agreement. Uh, so we've published a series of, of targets uh, there for, we publish metrics for, for nine sectors, you know, ranging from uh, fossil fuel extraction, so energy, to power, to the transportation sector, to cement, steel, and also to real estate, commercial, and residential. So that's one pillar. We have another pillar which is about mobilizing capital for, for the transition and for sustainable finance. So we have a one trillion dollar uh, cumulative target um, to 2030 uh, that we are that we are working uh, that we are working towards, uh, and we have also um, a series of um, client or transaction level uh, uh, criteria that we put in place in how we then go and implement that. Uh, so we mostly have them for uh, let's say energy sensitive subsectors. Um, you talked about engagement with uh, with oil and gas, so we have we have uh, policies around uh, around that, uh, in particular around um, uh, the non-conventional uh, source of fossil fuel, around uh, also um, the um, operations, in particular methane management uh, and how the, the quality of the operations, uh, and we've also introduced um, um, a criteria regarding. Uh, expansion short lead time, focusing on short lead time and putting constraints regarding long lead time development. So we have a series of policies um, and due diligence, if you will, that we perform uh, at client level. That's underpinned by risk management. So um, you, you talked about the GARP and, and the risk approach. It's, it's, in my, it's in my job title also. I, I, I look a lot at the downside and how um, the uh, risk experience of the past is not a good uh, necessarily a good indicator for the risk experience of the future and how can that support the case for um, shifting the allocation of the capital um, into, the, into, the, into the transition. Um, and that is really, um, to, to the point Tony you were making, it's about uh, getting now more concrete. You have, uh, when you think of the kind of metrics that you need for that, some of them are estimation of a spot position, you know, what emissions we we, we, a given company or our portfolio in a given sector is responsible for today. But then everything is, you know, needs to be forward-looking uh, in order to meet 20 to 2025 or 2030 targets that we have. It's, it's about trying to um, understand or trying to uh, loosely forecast what we think the companies in our portfolios are heading towards. Um, and uh, so we need new framework and new methodologies for that. So. I find that in climate we have very, true, very, uh, very few true data because even actually companies' emissions tend to be the product of estimation methodologies. Right? So, so we have very few true data. Um, we have estimate for current position and then we have um, more uh, what I call scorecard or, or, or um, methodologies that are not necessarily quantitative using kind of advanced mathematics simpler than that to try to describe where we think the, the portfolio the portfolio is heading towards. Um, so that's uh, just to give you an overview from the uh, high level uh, objective and constraint that we have as a company and then in terms of uh, declining that into uh, portfolio uh, and, and, and sector level. Uh, and clearly the data needs for, you know, you talked about flood mortgage in the UK for example is very different from uh, what, you, what the data need and what you, we need to do in industrial sectors. Uh, and, and so we have that element of um, uh, this is customer business uh, for Barclays, this client business for Barclays as a bank. It's not a buy decision to buy or not to buy a security. Um, and, uh, and that needs to be uh, reflected also in, in how we approach that and how we collect data and engage uh, and, and get into that feedback loop. To me. Um, so Oakley is a private equity investor, so I think we're the smallest fish out of, out of the panelists here. Um, so we have uh, 34 portfolio companies um, under our management at the moment, um, and we invest in tech, consumer, education, and business services across Europe predominantly, but we do have some global assets. And uh, my role is really, and our team's role, is to work directly with those companies that we're invested in to help them understand not only their climate um, impacts and how their operations impact the climate or the world around them, but kind of broader sustainability and ESG topics. 
Um, so listening to everyone around here, it's, it's quite interesting because we kind of our operations probably touch and have some impact on or you impact how we work. But um, and, and going back to Chris's earlier point, really our whole strategy is around engagement. Um, the companies that we work with are smaller; they're in the SME space. Um, they're quickly growing and often we're the first ones that are really starting to talk to them about sustainability and help them try to think about how sustainability impacts them. Um, they're often just under the kind of thresholds for regulations um, when we first make investment, but often by the time we exit, they're, they're in scope of, and will be in scope of CSRD or other uh, disclosure regimes. So, um, our role is to help them measure. So. Kind of, you know, talking about data and quality of data and the different metrics and frameworks out there. Um, measuring scope one and two emissions for companies that are doing it for the first time is a very heavy lift. So we're trying to really help them understand how that process works in different geographies where um, different um, energy providers provide um, emissions at different time scales. So for example, in Germany, you won't get your scope to emissions until a year after, because that's just the way it, dis it, it works. So when, when it goes to kind of disclosing up to our investors and our LPs, um, what are the, our scope one and two emissions of the portfolio, it becomes a bit tricky and there is no kind of standardization in that regard. Um, but really, uh, once we get kind of, and we're in a good place around scope one and two emissions, is scope three emissions and our supply chains um, that get tricky. Um, it's it's information that's hard to, to get, but also sometimes it's also really hard to get the information of your location of your suppliers and their assets. So to the point around insurability, actually, if you know your um, your supply chain has warehouses and they're being stored in southern Germany, for example, how can we work with insurance to ensure that um, we can influence, for example, the location that the warehouse is going to be located so that we know it's not in a floodplain and has that long-term insurability. Um, so, so kind of, I think my, kind of in terms of data and how we use data, um, one is trying to just get good quality scope one, two, and potentially scope three emissions. Then looking at our portfolio, who, who's got the highest emissions and why? and then starting to work with them during our investment period. So I didn't say we usually hold our investments for about three to five years. So it's working with those companies to figure out, okay, how can we um, influence or adapt um, your operations to make sure that, um, that they are future-proof to a changing world around them. So I think I mentioned earlier, one of our companies manufactures as a small manufacturing facility in Italy. They were really impacted by the changing um, energy prices. So actually went back and we installed some solar panels on the facilities there, which has helped them become less reliant on the changing energy prices and have control over their, um, over their energy usage. But um, to, to Tony, to your point around hail, I haven't considered that one yet, so hopefully they'll be all right. Um, but yeah, so it's really trying to figure out which of our companies have the highest emissions, how we can get them onto a decarbonization pathway, thinking kind of this TPT framework as well. Um, but for a lot of them, they're, you know, they're still starting out. These are the guys that are on the ground. Some of them only have 30, 40 employees. Um, but kind of my theory is that the earlier we can have these discussions with them, the more they can embed them into their growth for the longer term. So, Yeah, brilliant. So, I mean, we've heard many dimensions, different kind of decisions that you need to make, different types of data. And actually, when you talk about data, it's like, it's too big, really. It covers too, too many different dimensions. I mean, you're thinking about, you know, on the physical risk side, you can think about the companies themselves, their supply chains, their trade routes. If you think about transition risk, you know, you might think about carbon pricing, or reputational impacts, or the impact of technology. You then think about adaptation and resilience. You know, so there's, there's so many dimensions to all of this. So I'm curious, which are the areas across all of that that give you the most headaches when it comes to influencing your ability to take good decisions? We'll come back to you, don't worry. Um, so Nest, I think, along with a, a number of other asset owners in the industry, has been quite focused on the transition. And I think we've been focused on trying to develop and encourage the right data that we need to 
um, help facilitate the right decisions across a very globally diversified portfolio. We've done a lot of work ensuring that the fund managers have access to good quality data and are using it in the right way and are evidencing to us how they're using it. So I think we are further along the curve when it comes to transition risk data and incorporating elements of that in a the portfolio. There is more consistency. I think that's helped by the TCFD framework, for example. So I think even though within that, there is differentiation in the way our fund managers do report to us, and that is a headache. Um, but in more, in more recent years, we, in the last year or so, we've turned our focus to um, physical climate risk. Um, and, and that's an issue I think we as investors in the world sees now becoming much more material to investments to companies around the world. We, we see and we, we are witnessing you know, hazards and, and climate disasters playing out globally. And it is something now that we as investors that have interests around the world need to start thinking about. Um, and one of the things that Nest has done, we've um, partnered with the University of Oxford, got one of the academics working with us at Nest, who's been seconded with us to look at the array of climate data that's available across the market um, on physical climate risk, and looking at the extent to which it's fit enough to be used by investments to inform their investment decision making. Mm -hmm. So um, the work that's been conducted is um, a, a kind of a, a research across um, data tools across the market, looking at the ESG data um, providers, looking at the kind of physical data that they have. And I think there's no surprise that there's very little correlation between the different tools. They, they're all focusing on different things. They're all doing different things. I think that's fine. But I think it's important to interrogate the pros and cons of each one. Um, one of the things that we've found is that the data tools are pretty good at um, location-specific risks, identifying location-specific risks, looking at the extent to which um, companies around the world are exposed to different hazards. But one of the, the shortfalls in the data at the minute is identifying the actual vulnerability of these risks to specific companies and how they're building resilience to that. Um, so we've taken a lot of the, the research that's been done and we've had some discussions with our fund managers who we've also asked to do some work on this and they found the same problem that whilst the location hazard exposure is something that we can identify, we, we, we're stuck on how, to, on how to manage these risks now with companies. So one of the things that we've got running on the transition risk side is an engagement framework where the fund manager is identifying the biggest laggards across our portfolio and we've asked them to start embed, embedding some of that physical risk analysis within their transition conversations with companies. So where companies have been flagged up to, to score quite highly from a risk perspective, ask our fund managers to start engaging with those companies, um, start having conversations with management on do you know that you're actually located in the flood zone? What are you doing to manage that? Have you got sort of your operations around the world in different facilities? Um, and start setting objectives of physical climate risks within our engagement framework. So that's one of the ways we can do it. But again, it, it's very piecemeal. Each investors are doing their own thing on this, and we need a unified and joint up um, coordinated action on how to do this. Um, and one of the other things that we've done is a risk mapping exercise across our portfolios. And we found doing this in our private markets portfolios is easier. You know, particularly on, on infrastructure, we're just working with one asset, so we can easily engage with the fund managers on the location of those assets, and they've got much more direct control and exposure to management on how to manage those assets. But it's equities, bonds, it's sovereigns, it's a whole other um, array of asset classes where the challenges are really around physical risks reside. So not much then. <laughs> Tony. Uh, I should have expected that from you, Jeff. Um, um, I kind of feel like I want to say, Deandra, okay, Bill, see us afterwards. Um, I don't know if it's actually the data that's the problem really here. I find it's actually more of a, what do you do with it? Um, how, how do you interpret it? And also, how do you educate others to interpret it? So, for example, um, I can make a very broad brush statement here on transition. All the time we talk about transition risk. And transition risk is primarily hurting or potentially can hurt high carbon industries. But actually, there's also the flip side of that is transition opportunity. There is a lot of opportunity there. At the end of the day, adaptation and transition will, will work if we can make money out of it. So showing the business case from that. Um, I would say SMEs is the other area. 
how do you model SME exposure is really, really tough when it's just not in their DNA. And I would also classify uh, in that area in emerging markets or areas where jurisdictionally reporting is not um, embedded into how people do work. Um, but and, and I take your point, Piedra, also on that there's so many models out there, they, if you look at them, they will give you a different answer. And I think the problem is that everybody expects them looking through the same lens. And it's actually understanding, if you can, because uh, some of them, I think Diana said it, they're proprietary um, data models, and they don't like to sort of open the box up to, for inspection. Um, understanding how they got to those answers, what methodology that they went through, what lens are they looking at, is really, really important. But ultimately, it's how do you then tie that to a business decision? How do you tie that to what is the strategic um, advantage for me making this decision in a changing world versus that decision? And part of that will be insurability, but part of that is also for example, we talked about physical risk. Um, how often am I going to be, or how is the risk that we currently price in at a one in 100 year event in three years time is going to turn into a one in 50 year event is going to turn into a one in 20 into one in five. Um, and also that is changing so fast. We need to be cognizant of tipping points. And I know we had a colleague from the University of Exeter here as well, they're doing fantastic work on tipping points. That this is really, really important because it isn't going to be linear change we're going to see, whether it's transition, adaptation, physical, whatever. That's really the crucial thing. So I, don't, I think we often put the blame that we don't get enough data and it's not accurate enough. And it's more about what can we actually learn from that data how do we interpret it? And how do we incorporate things that really change, the, the change that's coming into that data? Uh, our final example is we often debate about scope three. And everybody says scope three data is really crap. We get it. But actually, I think people sort of think it's at accounting level data. Scope three is really there to give you an idea where your impacts are, not necessarily to be accounted mm -hmm. down to the... Um, kilogram of uh, uh, CO2. I, it does make me laugh sometimes, and I, I've seen this in reports where people report whether it's a temperature alignment pathway or CO2 emissions to false accuracy. Um, that always makes me a little bit worried when that happens. So, taking it back up again. Look at how you're interpreting the data, what models you've used, and can you make this into a decision useful piece of information strategically as well as in the short term? Yeah, super interesting. Billy, you? It's very interesting. There's, there's plenty to say, really. Uh, there's plenty to say. Um, I, I'll, I'll go back to, to some of the things that's, that's gone through uh, the, the conversation, which is okay, we have to make decisions and we don't have good data and there is uncertainty around the future. On the one hand, some of it is very unique and very specific to climate. On the other hand, you know, we face this day in and day out in plenty of other things, you know, market risk and geopolitics and, you know, the shape of the yield curve and so on and so forth. Cyber a few years ago. Uh, exactly. So it's... it's um, there are some specifics uh, for climate, and clearly, probably starts from a from a from a um, uh, from a place that is more difficult than most of those other areas where we have established practices. And, and in a sense, it's the fact that the system is has a, has a way to dealing with this uncertainty, right? So we know, let's say, market risk, value at risk is is imperfect, and people have their way. You know, it was created by now thirty years ago. People have their own uh, various uh, ways, uh, and people understand that this is good for some things, but not for everything. And maybe you combine it with some other ways into managing your risk. So, climate is clearly started much later, um, and we, we won't go into nature. But climate started much later. But in a sense, the fact that you know, the, the, as as a, 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 let's say, financial uh, uh, 
institutions or investors would have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty is really not that uh, kind of unique. So it's about, uh, we know that the, 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 the size of the brush is probably broader and more directional than in other areas. Um, and yes, we, we, we can look at, um, okay, specifically in flood, what's a, what a delta in uh, the difference that people see into various location. We can compare uh, on the corporate side how the risk of stranded assets and how uh, well people project that uh, companies will fare under such and such scenarios and there will be differences there which are sometimes uh, quite, quite large. But I, our job is to make decision in the face of that. Um, and um, uh, clearly, I don't think there's a, there's a danger for now of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, the risk of uh, spurious accuracy. I don't think people take those numbers are, are being uh, accurate. Uh, but there is on the climate an urgency to act, right? And, um, and it's, 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 about, uh, it's about acting. So, to make it maybe into to take two uh, kind of quite quite concrete quite concrete examples, in in companies um, when you when you think about so large large multinational companies involved in some of the sectors that uh, Chris talked about, it's about okay what's the best we can do into estimating their spot position, what's the best we can do in understanding what they are doing about it, you know where, where they're putting their capex, what are they expanding in, how well positioned they are naturally given cost base or the physical property of their products or plants. Um, so it's what the best we can do there and then we have decision to make about um, uh, how we accompany them, where do we want to overweight, where do we want to take uh, kind of uh, um, strong commercial positions and so on and so forth. And then over multi-year, you know, we have 2025, we have 2030 uh, targets, is that, that gives you uh, uh, kind of over multi-year time horizon, uh, short or mid-term, how those, uh, how those um, uh, strategies kind of play out and, and, uh, and how they show up in metrics, but also how do they, uh, how do they kind of, what do they mean in, the, in, in practice in the real world that has changed physically, because climate is always, a, it's an exchange of, uh, of uh, you know, chemicals in the, in the atmosphere, so that's what matters ultimately. And then only if you take the example of something very different, which is like a mortgage uh, in the UK, um, we are very lucky, for example, in the UK where we have relatively good information on the energy performance. Uh, and the, we are the, uh, the, the UK is the envy of a lot of other countries because we have this central database that the, that the government has created. Um, we know that the EPC methodologies are not uh, perfect. They've been calibrated to the cost of energy a few years ago. They describe theoretical usage, not actual usage, and so on and so forth. But it gives you something to start from. Um, and, and it's about making the decisions knowing that the margin for error is there, and hence we need to progress, um, uh, but we, we, we need to progress carefully noting that we are uncertain, so we can't, we can't look at those metrics as if they were pinpoint. Mm. Okay, good explanation for you. Yeah, I think from, from my perspective, I think one of the biggest challenges is around our time horizon. So we tend to invest kind of in a three to five year um, uh, cycle, um, which means one, firstly, trying to obtain the data um, and then getting decision useful data. So actually trying to get data that will help us identify links to financial opportunities um, and whether we can influence that during the hold of our investment period. Um, I think that um, that's often challenging to, to get. And, and, but then when you look at the flip side, like mitigating that risk in our short time horizon is actually quite challenging to do because the risk that you're seeing now are much, kind of the models are longer or at least the models that we can get access to because there's also a whole kind of debate about, you know, we have X amount, you know, a fairly low amount of assets and trying to get really detailed models for all of them is going to be very expensive. So is that a good use of, you know, financial, um, uh, uh, well, finance. Um, so, so for us, it's trying to, to, to really get granular data from companies who haven't reported it before, and then their supplier, supply chain. So looking at supply chain risk, because often our companies don't have many assets, and they're not in highly emitting sectors, but their supply chains are. And when we've done the kind of scenario analysis around like 
we get into kind of medium to medium high risk around transition and physical risk as a supply chain. And getting insights into your supply chain is still quite challenging. Um, and yes, we can do supplier engagement and working with them to understand how they're, um, how they're accounting for climate risk and, and their emissions. But actually, we need to really kind of work on estimates as well at that point, um, which we're starting to do. Uh, but I, I think, you know, it's, it's, you know, there are scope three and supply chain emissions are there scope one and two. So it's like getting the global community to be moving and understanding what their emissions are. And using, for us, it's also using the, the bigger multinationals who have access to inf this information to also get access to that information to understand how much of our, our company's supplies is um, it being, you know, contributing to this one specific fa factory in China, for example, and then bringing that up. But again, it, it sort of is kind of estimates in order of magnitudes rather than getting really specific data. Brilliant. Um, in a former life, I, I ran the statistics division in the Bank of England, which was collecting data for users. And I used to think, you know, data or statistics, a bit like sausages, they're kind of tasty and really useful, uh, but you really don't want to know what goes into them. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's have some questions before lunch. And yeah, I don't know if somebody's got a microphone here. We'll take three questions and then you can kind of give your vote of impressions, yeah. Um, hi, is that okay for Yeah, me? sure. Okay, so uh, I'm Quinton Rare from P1 Investment Management. And uh, following Chris Dobwell, Dobwell's comment about uh, the importance of engagement, I've got a question for Billy Suet of Barclays. Um, so regarding his initial comment about true data, um, how would you answer the challenge that you don't actually need better data to know that uh, closing Barclays policy loopholes that allow financing fracking to know that that's helpful for climate? <laughs> okay, you don't need better data. And, and isn't the claim to need more data often just a standard tactic to delay meaningful action? Okay, so... And if the panel <laughs> wants to join in, Chris. Right. Let's take another couple before we... Thanks for that. Okay. Yeah. Ah, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. Um, down here, please. <coughs> in the front. For a lot of the models, when you actually run the data through the models and the results that you get, sometimes can be counterintuitive to, um, I guess, lay people when you're trying to explain it to them. What I mean by that is, if you're thinking about um, climate as an enterprise externality, and then you start to run things like climate value at risk, and you run it through different scenarios, what you often get is, in a Paris aligned scenario, for example, portfolio values will fall by 25, 50, 75 percent, but in a hothouse scenario, it will be like 2 percent. So from a portfolio uh, explanation point of view to clients, from a client perspective, it's much better that the model gets hotter because they lose less money uh, based on the metrics and the data that they actually see, which makes it very counterintuitive and difficult to actually explain. But from a scientific point of view, it actually makes sense because in one instance, you are pricing the unpriced externality into the portfolio value, the other you're not. So that nuance is such a difficult thing to explain to clients to then have a conversation about transition and say, well, actually, you're going to lose more money if you transition Paris, but you still uh, you know, should be investing in other things. But hothouse, you're not going to lose money. You know, it just, it just, it's just a very, very difficult conversation. So I think we, we spend a lot of time thinking about data and models and modeling perfectly, et cetera, et cetera. But the results today are very counterintuitive to the overall effort that we are making in order to helping our clients transition to our portfolio as well. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, uh, Chris and Billy. Hmm. Good point. I think probably it shows the inadequacy of us actually modeling a hothouse world because I suspect we're all going to hell in that world. Um, yeah, at the back. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Lange, strategy to green. We heard a lot about uh, double materiality. You spoke about adaptation. And I would like to use the decision-making uh, part of this conversation for the two extremes. 
I would like to understand how you use data and analytics to speak to governments and give them direction for what you expect them to do. Because when we talk about sovereign bonds, for example, they are very important. When we talk about adaptation, often it requires collective action. How you use data and analytics to bring them to the table, give them direction. But on the other side of the spectrum, how do you use data and analytics to hold accountable the individual banker or the asset manager that might want to maximize profit for this year because they want to have the best bonds, right? How do you make sure that what they do reflects the long-term uh, thinking and pricing? Okay, great. Let's... Oh, Billy, do you want to be in the hot seat? <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I, will, uh, I will start. Um, Maybe on the first question, and I think on the second, it's probably uh, there's probably a, a spread of uh, a spread of us who uh, can be helpful. So, first of all, uh, I I hope that uh, through um, what I've said today, but also through all the disclosure we put out, um, there is there is no doubt that we are taking action and we are not waiting for better data or analytics because that's that's not uh, the the um, what's going on there. We actually, uh, back in 2020, where we adopted our climate strategy, which, which was uh, to align the commitment, which was stamped by a shareholder vote, to align the portfolio uh, emission profile to the objective of the Paris Agreement, at that point we had no data, no methodology uh, to speak of. Uh, so we took the commitment first uh, with some element of analysis going behind it, but the development of the data and the rollout uh, has come uh, following that. So, I, um, so, so that's, that's uh, I, I think, important. I think today we have, on the uh, emission side, we publish metric for uh, nine sectors, and we have target for eight. Uh, two of them, the energy and power, are for 2025, uh, as well as 2030. Uh, so you're talking in the context of uh, kind of any any company or any institution, uh, relatively short-term uh, commitment that will be delivered by this management team, uh, and not something uh, delaying action for the future. Then to come up to your second point, which was around our energy policy, which we've we've updated uh, recently, uh, kind of earlier and earlier this year, and you made a point specifically around around fracking. So, um, first of all, from, from a wording standpoint, so the, the, the way that uh, we approach the energy uh, sector, sorry, first of all, let me start by saying, it's, it's not a loophole, fracking is not a loophole, it's very transparent uh, and, uh, in, in the way that the, that the policy is laid out. The policy focus, focuses on trying to find the balance between the IAA, uh, you know, net zero scenario and the de decarbonization, um, uh, and uh, as well as uh, uh, considerations such as uh, the reality of energy, uh, of energy um, of security. So the point around fracking and the, 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 the policy focuses on drawing a distinction between expanding in oil and gas reserves that are long lead time and that concept of locking, uh, locking carbon, uh, which the policy puts uh, very clear restrictions around. Uh, and fracking in the US, uh, which happens to have a very short um, uh, lead time, uh, and hence, um, when you think about the long term, the mid to long term projection uh, under those scenarios of um, uh, fossil fuel consumption, uh, that shorter lead time is consistent with also the position of the IAA net zero in the scenario, uh, which, is, which is a reference scenario. Now, then I would conclude by saying that there are also other elements of our approach to the energy sector. That policy that you refer to is, is one. We've also um, uh, adopted uh, back in 2020 a financed emission uh, uh, target for that sector. So it is scope one, scope two, and scope three. Uh, it includes both the lending that we do, but also capital market uh, um, financing that we may uh, arrange uh, for companies in those sectors. Um, and we have also a target which was adopted both with a 2025 um, uh, timestamp and a 2030 timestamp. 
uh, we've reduced our finance emission by 44%. That the data as at uh, December, uh, the, the last uh, published report, so December 23, we've reduced it by 44% in that time period, which is far in excess of uh, the reference pathways. Um, so um, we, we try to have a quite considerate uh, approach uh, to the sector. We've made uh, clear, um, we made very clear, uh, we've made very clear um, uh, uh, commitment uh, towards those, those facets and we have portfolio level constraints that are supported by, uh, by policies um, and uh, it's, all, it's all published uh, out there for the discussion and I would be also uh, very happy because I can see from your body language that the, that the, um, that the answer uh, you think uh, has left you uh, lacking uh, would be would be yeah, sorry would be would be would be very happy to to offer an, uh, a conversation uh, on on the topic with uh, the time that it will uh, affording the time that it takes to probably get to the bottom of some of the argument which is not what this panel is for. Let's let's move on in the interest of time, Chris. I'm going to let you have so, those so questions. I, I'll, I'll have a go. I'll try and have a go at all of them really quickly. I, I mean, what what strikes me from the conversation, listening to everyone here, fantastic contributions, is that um, you know the use case kind of idea of splitting up data might be one thing, but also I think we need to think about um, splitting data uh, you know, from being a homogenous data and analytics into. What are the types of data that we need? So when is it? When do we need accounting sort of level data, as Tony was saying? When do we need stuff that just isn't accounting? Stuff where estimates will work. So scope three emissions, avoided emissions, engagement metrics. You're never going to be kind of held accountable. What's the stuff that you really, really need? I mean, actually, I'd come back to something that Emily said in the first session, which is asset locations. We can't assess physical risk. We can't assess nature unless we've got asset locations. If a company lies about its asset location, that's actually quite a big deal. So that's where you'd want a real degree of precision. But there might be other areas, and we've just talked a bit about kind of things that people might be reporting, but they've got to defend what they're doing. But I'd say in other areas where we want to be more uh, creative, then actually we want to encourage disclosure and really discourage green hushing. So you know, if you can put you, and you actually want people to be offering up data that maybe isn't quite as good quality, but it's better than nothing. Um, I think on the, so this idea about delaying action to do with data, I think we could maybe work out a way of segregating it so that you actually work out what's the stuff that needs to be precise, where are estimates okay, and where is it we just want to know what you're doing. Um, on the scenario question and this kind of mismatch between the hothouse world, I mean, I would, I would go back to this question, I would actually go back to the University of Exeter scenarios. I mean, the, when you read that, that No Time to Lose report, and you put it in front, I've put, I've put that in front of the investment team, thanks to the guys who came in and helped facilitate a workshop. And it's, you're not talking about climate value at risk, you're talking about GDP impacts, you're talking about um, you know, destruction of markets. It, there's some pretty big stuff happening in a hothouse world when you actually start thinking about it. It's not just a nice, calm, linear um, change to, to weather patterns. So get into the real detail of that, and I think that when the work that uh, you guys are doing, when you start to get into getting some numbers that come out of it, I think that could be really key. Um, I'll quickly cover the bits about engagement with governments. Um, we don't do a lot of work of engaging with sovereigns, but when we get brought in to talk to government, what we try and come in and talk about is real economy policy, and how do you... Um, how do you mobilise private investment and what does the government need to do? What risks do they need to be thinking about sharing with the private sector so that actually you reach a tipping point and the investment really starts to flow? And that involves a really detailed understanding of the economics of individual sectors and what's kind of going to make those work. We've got a great example here under the Labour government in the 2000s where we did that with offshore wind brought in investors with government and you know, hopefully a new administration might kind of go down that same line. And lastly on holding people to account. So we fully integrated ESG and engagement into the incentives of our analysts. They're responsible for companies, they're responsible for the assessment of climate risk, they're responsible for pricing that in and for understanding it and they're responsible for doing company engagements and that's part of their remuneration. So, but Impact remains a perform. You know, we are a red-blooded kind of performance-first business. We just happen to think that our performance exists in these sectors that are going to benefit from the transition. 
So there's a, I think you can integrate these things rather than choose um, mm. performance over um, climate data. Brilliant. Well, sadly, we've had to, apparently, we've got to go to lunch, which I think is extraordinary because I think this panel's brilliant. Um, but anyway, thank you very much, panelists, and thank you, the audience, for some great questions. Great. Thank you so much for such a, a fabulous panel. We are indeed at lunch, um, but we will reconvene at 1.30, so we're going to have a slightly shorter lunch. Just as a, a point of process for the afternoon, um, as I talked about earlier and you've seen in the programme, the afternoon is going to have split sessions, so we're going to continue to have panels in here, but we're also going to have an innovation showcase and a research showcase in the Godfrey Mitchell room. If you want to go to the showcase, please know that the opening remarks, the, uh, the fireside chat that we're going to have between 1.30 and 2 o'clock will be streamed directly to the Godfrey Mitchell room as well. So effectively, the request then is to, to, to avoid too much moving around. If you do want to do the showcase session in the afternoon, can you please go there for 1.30 as opposed to come here and then go there for 2 o'clock? Does that make sense? Um, and on the tipping points panel, actually, if you, if you are interested in, in hothouse world scenarios and, and perhaps the fact that they're not quite being modelled as we think they should be, uh, just a bit of a tip off that well, well worth going to, uh, coming to the, the tipping point session this afternoon. But uh, enjoy lunch, slightly shorter than originally planned, but um, for good reason. And many thanks to the, the brilliant panellists. Thank you. Thank you.